These aren't my stories, but ones that my little brother told me. He's a geosciences grad student at the moment. He's been doing field work in Wyoming for about four years now, usually in summer. He's seen most of the wildlife there is to see up there, shy of cougars who apparently avoid their camps. He's also seen some weird shit that he couldn't explain. I'm fuzzy on technical details since we're that close, and I've never paid much attention to his studies, so most of the fieldwork stuff he told me is where things get a bit confused. I'll try not to go into any of the jargon why stuff he told me since I'm sure I'd get it wrong beyond the basics. Anyway, the stories. Story 1, Day 0. Roughly two-week undergrad externship program in Wyoming, spans over spring break plus a week. Dave shows up with two classmates from his program, Kelly and Junior, meets the other externs. Total of 20 people in this class session. Going to be doing survey work and checking up on geothermal activity or some such. Taking core samples, mapping terrain and formations, Doppler readings, all that jazz. Students camping in tents. But there's a trailer to store equipment, a few outbuildings for cooking and showers, and a fence around the compound. Also two latrines and a semi-permanent shelter with concrete floor and tables. Rustic, but safe enough. Dave and Junior sharing a really swanky, big tent that got ditched at previous internship by an international student. Common event apparently, since they can't transport them home easily. Kelly plants her single near theirs in the rough circle of tents. Orientation time. Class divided up in five groups of four and assigned territory and tasks. Dave, Junior and Kelly all in different groups. First night is pretty quiet, but cold as balls, and there's a light dusting of fresh snow the next morning. Day 1 to 3. Everybody's up before first light to get ready for field work, groups split up and head off. Each group has a supervisor, and are taken to their specific survey area in a truck by said supervisor. First few days of work goes as planned, no surprises. A bit more snowfall during the first half of the week, but no problem. Day 4. On the fourth morning, while they're eating breakfast, Kelly asks if the boys came and tapped on her tent the night before. Dave and Junior say no, they were wiped and went straight to sleep. Kelly says she woke up with someone tapping at her tent just by her head and whispering her name. By the time she got up and unzipped the flap, they were gone. They decide it must have been one of her group members trying to ask her about the previous day's data, or the next day's work. Who knows, she decides to pursue it later when they go out to work. Day continues again as normal. Nighttime again, Dave and Junior shooting the shit before going to sleep. Hear someone tapping their tent at their feet before they go to sleep. Is anybody there? Hello? From outside the tent. Sounds like Kelly. They turn on the lamp, open up the flap, but nobody's there. Figure she went back to her tent, light is on inside. Dave goes and asks her what she wanted. No response, no one inside. Fresh snow again. Footprints leading away from her tent towards the latrines. Dave assumes she just wanted someone to walk over there with her, since it's dark as fuck other than the motion lamps. He shrugs, heads back to his tent and goes to sleep. Day 5 to 12. Next day, Kelly doesn't join them for breakfast and eats with her survey team instead. Don't get to ask her what she wanted. Dave feels weird all day, and notices that his work team is really jumpy. One of Dave's workmates insists he saw a bear while they were in the field, and they decide that's why everyone is on edge. Some kind of primordial instinct can sense the predator lurking or some shit. Night rolls around again, and Dave and Junior are about to sleep when that tapping comes again. It's really dark, I can't see you. Come out. Kelly's voice again. Junior tells her, just a second and I'll turn on the lamp. They open the tent, no Kelly. Her tent isn't lit up. Footprints aren't clear because there's been no fresh snow all day. Fuck it, they go and tap on Kelly's tent. Light turns on and she chews them out for waking her up again. Again? 
Dave apologizes and drags Junior back to their tent. Dave tells Junior about the bear one guy saw at this point. Junior makes jokes about skinwalkers on the mountain, and they both go to sleep feeling a bit on edge. Day 6. Next morning, everyone in camp seems a bit out of it, people talking about the stupid pranks everyone else is pulling, and no one is getting enough sleep Bearsider mentions Dave tapping on his tent. Dave mentions Kelly. Two other guys both mention someone else entirely. Almost everyone reports some kind of mysterious nighttime visitor that wasn't there. They're starting to get a bit paranoid and the supervisors tell them to knock it off with the pranks, there's work to be done. The pranks continued for the rest of the trip, but no one was hurt, turned up acting weird, or went missing. People were just jittery and ready to get the fuck out of camp by the end of it all. Summer internship time, sweet. Free day, so Dave and M.O., international student on his first time, go hiking. Pack lunch, Dave's gun, and bear mace. Head out into the woods. Beautiful scenery, fantastic views. They go do their thing and Dave is snapping photos to send his girlfriend back home. Suddenly, Dave notices M.O. isn't beside him anymore. They're at the top of a ridge looking into a particularly picturesque valley. Lots of dense trees, not a lot of visibility. Dave doesn't panic, figures M.O. had to shit and stepped out of view. Starts calling Mo's name. No answer, just echoes. Oh. Dave doesn't leave the ridge, but starts looking around for any sign of this guy. Nothing in sight, so he keeps calling the guy's name. Eventually he hears three blasts from a safety whistle. Oh. Dave starts to backtrack the way they came, figuring that M.O. turned around before him and got lost slash went off their trail. Another three blasts, this time louder. Dave keeps following the sound, but there's no M.O. by now, Dave thinks something fucked up is going on, and gets out the bear mace just in case apparently contemplated his handgun, but didn't go for it. He stops and waits to see if he hears any more whistles. Sure enough, three blasts, practically on top of him. Dave almost jumps out of his skin. M.O. comes running down the hill out of nowhere and almost slams into him. Dave is pissed, almost bear maces M.O. in the face, demands to know where he went. M.O. is equally pissed and demands to know why Dave left him standing on the ridge all alone. They confer and it comes to light that neither of them blew their safety whistle, though they both heard it. Both thought the other had wandered off the ridge and was calling for help. No more whistle blowing follows, no one else from camp was going hiking. Camp is isolated from normal camping areas or parks. Dave and Mo nope the fuck back to camp as fast as they can go, even though they'd planned to be out several more hours. Same summer internship as story above. Hiking with a different intern, Joey. Everything's going good, they're looking for a place to chill out and have lunch. Find a little creek babbling away, only a few feet across and super shallow. Being geology geeks, they start discussing whether this should be on the survey or not outside target zone, but still possibly relevant because of water source, etc. After lunch, they pack up and start to head back the way they came towards camp. Except it's not the way back towards camp. It's almost like they found a loop or some shit, keep ending up back at that creek bed. After about an hour of this, they decide to just follow the creek bed for a while to see if maybe they just turned down the wrong path stop when they find a weird little cairn on an island, in the middle of this narrow creek. Geology geeks and rockhounds, so they notice the rocks don't match the area quite right. Pile of big chunks of limestone with a huge green quartz at the base. Deer skull at the top of the pile with the antlers crossed under it. Bleached from exposure, looks brittle and old. Dave says they should go back the way they came, because fuck that ritualistic looking horror movie shit. Joey agrees, but is weirded out mostly by the stones rather than the skull. No proper limestone deposits in the area apparently, and that kind of quartz is only in a specific part of the state. I wouldn't know, just repeating what Dave said here. They go back the way they came and finally get back on their trail properly. 
Dave tells me he thinks whatever built that pile of rocks, it wanted them to see it before they left, like it was warning them to stay out of its territory or something. Dave and Joey went hiking another day with M.O., but couldn't find the creek or the cairn a second time. Dave was relieved because he didn't want to go back, but after the first hiking trip, M.O. said he was curious. Through stupid circumstances, Dave gets separated from his work crew in the field. Middle of fucking nowhere on the mountain. Realizes he's lost. Fuck shit to it. Has a map and GPS and all the safety gear he should have, but nothing is working quite right. E.g., compass is stuck and won't rotate to face magnetic north, GPS claims to have no signal, phone likewise has no signal and went from 80% charge to 5% in about 5 minutes fuck this shit, fuck it to hell. Against better judgment, he decides to try to find his way back. Dave tries to backtrack, but can't seem to go in a straight line. He finally sits down and considers blasting with his whistle to see if he can get attention from his group. Right as he's about to blow that whistle, a fuck-off huge raven drops down from a tree onto a rock formation a little ways from him. Raven puffs up real big, and flies a few trees off with that croaky cawing noise they make. Dave's impersonation of the sound cannot be described with text, but it's hilarious. Stops, and puffs up again watching him. Dave says he doesn't know why, but he decides to follow the raven. They don't generally come anywhere near people this far out, just garbage if they can get it, so this bird was acting funny. Raven keeps up the leading game, flying a few yards ahead at a time while Dave follows. After about 30 minutes, Dave starts to recognize the terrain. After 45 minutes, he's almost back to the survey site, and the raven is gone. Didn't fly away, just disappeared when he looked away from it for a minute to get his bearings. Most of the other stories he told me weren't supernatural at all, just a bit eerie. He and his work crew ran into a bear face to face during summer once. At a distance of maybe 10 yards. It just looked at them for a few minutes, and went back to rooting around and doing its thing. They also had a pack of wolves show up and check out their perimeter fence another time. Nothing malicious, just curious and probably had smelled food or the like. They didn't come back. He had a couple of other spooky stories that were pretty bland. Things like his team encountering a guy in the woods where there were no habitations. And he wasn't carrying gear like a camper or hiker either. He looked a bit like a farmer who just strolled out of his field instead of a dense tree lean. There was also a guy who got attacked in a lake while everyone was fishing. They decided to take a break, so he went for a swim. Had a huge row of bite marks in his leg, but they couldn't say what it was that did it. Eventually put it down to some kind of introduced gar fish and called it good. Nobody went swimming for the rest of that trip, though. Mind if I ask where in Wyoming? I currently live there and would love some spoopy adventures. I'll shoot him an email to ask, since he didn't really say at the time. I went through his Instagram just now to see where he took photos during the periods the stories are from. Most of his vacation photos from before and after each period of internship are in Idaho or the NW portion of the state, so I'd assume his survey trips were probably relatively close to the area as well. He got back to me and was a bit vague about Wyoming. He mentioned Cody but otherwise was all over the state. He's also done more trips than I thought. He's up to nine and maybe going again this year. He said he's also done trips to Montana and Idaho for survey stuff, and mentioned Elkhorn, Big Hole River, Idaho, and the Tobacco Root Range, Montana. He also sent me a photo of all the tents left behind by students on these trips, set up in his yard. He now has a total of nine, plus the one he bought originally for himself years ago. Basically my nope is that I think there is something living, walking around in my ex best friend's skin. Will tell the tale and the nopes that led up to it. July last year, me and friend both 18, decide to go camping for a week. End up not liking any of the lame paid campsites, we are doing this the old way goddammit. Illegally camp, in this amazing area surrounded by paddocks and woods and etc. Far away from houses, 
properties, nearest town at least half hour drive away. Fuck snakes and spiders, we are Australian. First few days of camping are great though it was pretty rainy. Every night we end up talking for hours and being hilarious. Then go to sleep in a massive swag I brought. The place is great but for some reason we stick together. It made me uneasy to be alone and for some reason we always made sure we were within viewing. Distance of one another one night we ended up huddled in fear. Can hear something walking around. To dot fucking swag walks around us for hours while we both nope dot jpg the fuck out. Hear fucked up screech from a distance. Nose like wind going past really fast and footsteps stop. We're camped in a clearing no wind can get through the trees like that hasn't this whole time. My friend laughs, ha 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 holy fuck Anon, that was scary as fuck. End up eventually going to sleep but wake up at noon. Next day, I'm cooking, oh shit we need more firewood, can't leave this food because it'll burn really fast. My friend volunteers, duh, first time one of us has gone into the wooded area alone. Friend pauses before going in, finally summons some fucking courage and disappears from sight, I'm a fucking master chef. Not wearing my watch but it's been like an hour. I'm nearly done cooking this stuff. As soon they're taking a shit, I'll give that fucker some privacy. Fire begins to fail so I have to ninja get some wood and finish the meal. Eventually I realize maybe inbred fuckers have raped and eaten my friend. Damn it I spent ages cooking this meal. I am willing to avenge at the risk of being raped and eaten myself. Grab big ass knife, rifle, torch and a bite of my delicious damper. Walk into woods yelling for friend, feel something watching me, beginning to get scared but not about to admit that. Come at you fucker it doesn't take that long to shit. See someone in woods in front of me, hear my mate laugh, hear screech behind me. Oh fuck nope dot jpg. Sprint that shit straight towards where I saw my friend. That fucker is unarmed. Be running, lose sight of friend. Call out to him. Motherfucker if you're dead I will kill you. End up breaking through wooded area into a paddock. Ah shit, chpeg, see something move in woods across the paddock. Looks big, bigger than me. Considers how many bullets I have. Probably not enough. Ha ha nope, run back through woods, get through to campsite. My friend is sitting there wearing a change of clothes. Ha 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 holy fuck Anna, that was scary as fuck. See nothing wrong with it. Ha ha stupid what did you do? Cover yourself in shit. He laughs. Oh wait, did you hear the screech? shakes his head i must be paranoid we dig into some delicious food tell him about the huge thing i saw he just laughs again i wouldn't worry about it that night sitting across from friend in front of fire i've decided to teach myself whittling whittling away cut my thumb friend looks at thumb i stick a band-aid on that shit and continue to whittle he's reading a book and has a little lantern with him i know what a maggot thing to do what's rustling and shit Crickets chirpy chirping away. Friend laughs at something he's read. I think about his laugh in the woods. Realize it's the exact same laugh as the one when the thing walked around the swag. Same laugh he did just then. Same as the first thing he said when I found him with different clothes on back at camp. He said the same words too. HM. Weird. Eventually decide to drink a bit. He's a lightweight. We both crawl into the swag giggling. I have the knife attached to my belt. I wake up once and find him staring at me. Drunk brain suddenly worried he might be going homo for a second while drunk. Talk about this girl I really like. He seems to be really aware and listening to everything I say. Suddenly feels like my bladder is gonna burst. I stagger out to this little river that goes past our campsite. Take a piss in the early morning light while in awe of the majesty of nature. See something gray sticking out of the river bed. Pull it out. It's my friend's shirt he wore yesterday before going into the woods. It's torn up pretty bad. A little bit of blood on it, too drunk to really put anything together. Lovingly Ray Berry, because my drunk brain thinks putting the cotton back to nature to decompose is a great idea. Clean hands on pants, climb back into swag, friend is fucking gone to the world. I pass out and wake up a couple of hours later. Friend still asleep, dirty hands, but then we both have dirty hands and stuff. Begin to nope about weird shit that's happening, fine needs restarting. While pushing the coals and ashes around to add wood properly I find a button off the pants he wore. Yesterday and a bit of grey cotton fabric like the stuff from his shirt. What the fuck? Today is the day we pack up and leave. When friend wakes up he's being as weird as he was yesterday. I'm packing. He gives me a weird look. I tell him to help. He asks if I can go get some firewood because he's hungry. 
I tell the bitch once we've done packing I'll hold his hand and go into the woods with him. Once we've packed up we both carry shit up to the car, which is hidden up near the bush track to get out of here. I've checked my car every day. He follows the whole way because the dumb fuck has probably forgotten where it is. We load up the car. I turn it on to make sure it's all good. I am able to tune radio. Pretty static why but there's a weather warning about storms hitting the area. We go back to campsite to grab the last shit. Can we go give firewood? Now, friend is standing just inside edge of woods, suddenly get this feeling deep in my stomach. Like instinctual fear or something. Really want to get the fuck out of there. Nah man. Weather warning. Eat some food we've got left over and we'll buy something hot when we hit the next town. It's an 8 hour drive home. While I finish picking up rubbish he doesn't even need anything but the fucker has been acting. Weird. Ask him if he's alright. Yeah. Anam. I'm fine. Are you sure we can't stay another night? I don't think the storm will hit here. See something move in woods behind him. What the fuck is that? He doesn't turn around. I pull out my knife and for some reason he goes almost into a defensive pose. Gives me weird look. Dude there was something behind you. He turns around then. I'm sure it was nothing, Anon. While we walk up to car he looks behind us a few times. I'm trying to act normal because he isn't. So, ow. When I was cleaning up the fire I noticed bits of your clothes in there. He says he wrecked them while collecting firewood and didn't want to add to the rubbish to bring. Back. Fucking weirdo dude you've never done shit like that before. He shrugs and looks around as we get up to the car. Feel like something is watching me. Once we're in the car and back out on the road, I feel better. I keep trying to make conversation, but he doesn't put much into the conversation. I turn on the radio. Every so often he repeats things some of the radio prisoners say. While we aren't talking I have time to think about it. Him not being worried about shit that worries me. Think about the weird looks he's been giving me in different situations. Feel sick and horrify. And I realize the faces are probably the faces I was pulling at him at those moments. He's been mimicking my expressions. Realize he's been repeating phrases I say and his laugh never changes. His clothes all torn up and burying them. Finding them burnt after I found them. Wanting me to go back into the creepy fucking woods for some reason. I know for a fact he isn't homosexual or some shit. He has a girl he likes and it's adorable. How chill he tries to be about it. Decide to give a little test. Talk about some stupid shit we did as kids. Ask him questions he just says. Oh I don't remember that part, or agrees with me. The more I think about it I realize he hasn't been acting like himself at all since he went. Missing while I coat. When we get to a town, I turn my phone on and call my mom. She's glad we had fun and stuff. Can't wait for us to get back in town and spend some time with her before I go back to work. FIFO for LYF. Ask him if he's gonna call his parents, weird look again. Then he gets his phone from his backpack. I buy grab money from our joint cash fund and buy us both lunch. He eats the almost raw steak from his burger, but doesn't want his chips or the rest of the bun or salad. He goes in, comes out with two more huge pieces of red steak, done rare. Wolfs those fuckers down while I finish my meal. Pulls out his phone again and fires off some texts. Notice some wicked bruises covering his upper arms. What the fuck happened there? Man, he shrugs, says the don't hurt. Well okay then. I change clothes and shower there. He is waiting by the car. Notice him staring and watching other people. Says he doesn't want to shower. I call him a smelly fucker and so he disappears for a bit. Comes back with new clothes and has had a shower thank Christ we both smelled like wildlings. Keep on driving. Now night time. Only an hour or two out away from home. He slowly begins to join conversation, but he doesn't sound the same as he used to. None of his speech habits like making puns the sick fuck. No talking about the girl he's crazy about. Decide to bring up the creepy shit that happened out at the campsite. I swear I thought about shooting at that horse or whatever that big thing was. But then I decided I liked my chances of not knowing. He laughs. I wouldn't worry about that. Anon. I begin to feel uneasy and think that maybe this isn't my friend sitting beside me anymore. What about that thing that walked around our tent? He gives me this weird smile. Maybe it was a werewolf, Anon, I laugh, or a hot chick who was lost, he grins wider. Or maybe something that was just checking us out, feel weird again. I force a laugh why would anything do that, like some cannibal or rapist. He looks out the window, I can't watch him cause I gotta keep my eyes on the road. Maybe they wanted to get out of there as badly as you did this morning, Anon. What the fuck did he just say? JPG. Glance at him, not looking at me. 
can feel my knife still on my hip in its holster, the rifle stored safely away in the back, haha, <laughs> like a skinwalker or some shit, trying not to drive this fucking car off the side of the row, something like that. We both go silent, he laughs, same, fucking laugh, but that would be impossible, right, Annan? I laugh, yeah, yeah it would be, radio goes on, and we don't talk for the rest of it, get to his house, help him get his shit out of my car, and then, I drive home, get inside, shaking, I'm a man, for fuck's sake, keep it together motherfucker, seriously think my friend died out there and there is something else living inside him now, weird shit has happened like his dog and cat have mysteriously disappeared, he doesn't hang out with us as much and even the girl he liked tried to hang out with him man she says he was really fucking weird. He apparently acts almost robotic lie and only eats hardly cooked meat like a fucking caveman. His mom even asked if he'd gotten into any fights because his skin is always bruised. Now, he could have joined a fight club or has become the clumsiest motherfucker ever but honestly my best friend is a totally different guy. He recently invited me to go camping again to the same spot. I had to say I was busy but I'm terrified that maybe there was more than one man when he tried to get me to go out into the woods with him he was trying to lure me out there for the same thing to happen to me. Shit's so fucked I ignore his calls now and whenever I get back from a swing at work all I get is complaints about his weird behavior and people asking if he's on drugs or some shit. For God's sake I've told my friends to never take him up on camping. And I told the girl I like, now my girlfriend. All this weird shit that happened and she agrees that he is a totally different person. He was a stand-up guy who was hilarious and laid back and now he is almost malicious and uncaring. And sometimes I can hear that fucking laugh in my head and that fucking screech. And it sucks being terrified of some asshole I used to love like a brother. And so concludes, the fucked up tale of me being convinced that my friend is no longer human, who he used to be. I have never in my life seen anyone change like that. Just. Some days I fucking nope the whole thing and hope that I'm just crazy and he's just gone on some sort of hardcore drugs. Should have asked him things that only he would know. Lie about something, make him agree with you, and there you go. A better way to tell. Or, just come clean with everything and see if he admits it in arrogance. That's pretty much what I did, and that's what set it off for me. Stupid shit we did as kids was like putting this purple goo into these girls' hair. He loves to tell that story because in order to get rid of the blame on us we put it in our own hair so we wouldn't get in trouble and they wouldn't tell. We got in trouble anyway. While we were driving I asked him if he remembered putting goo into girls' hair. He said yes. I asked him if he remembered if it was green, or blue or purple, or something, and he said he didn't remember, but was pretty sure it was green. Now, there is no fucking way he forgot. No fucking way. He fucking told that story a couple of weeks before we went down there. I also asked him shit about his first dog, Mo, he didn't remember shit about Mo. In fact it made me so fucking sick of his dig fucking responses that I stop, before he realized. I was getting upset. And God knows what would have happened if IT realized what I was doing. But I assume it can read. And it learns. Very fast. Like his phone. When I told him to call him parents he treated his phone like he had no fucking idea. But then by the time I bought food he was already texting people. And then he's mimicking my expressions and other people's and the radio's talking. It was fucking too spooky for me man. Maybe it makes me an asshole for being willing to drop a friendship that I've had pretty much my whole life over these experiences, but honestly what am I supposed to do? Hello officers. When I was on a camping trip with my best mate last year, and we spent a good amount of the time drinking and camping on illegal ground, which will get me fine if not imprisoned. I'm pretty sure something ate my friend's insides and is now wearing him ass, a meat suit. Could you please contact the proper authorities and have this entire town and said campsite nuked? H.A.H. From what I know, he hasn't attacked anyone physically or asked anyone else to go camping with him. A little background to start. I work as a topographer tracker for a local group in Colorado and Wyoming. My job consists of surveying areas and mapping out common game trails and popular places for herds to gather for hunting and ecological purposes. When I'm out, I'm mostly on an ATV until I find a game trail, which then I map out on foot. When I'm going long distances, 
I stop at outposts that have been set up along the trail to refuel and rest for the night, or go to in case of hazardous weather. I've seen some things that have made me question what's out there, such as mutilated deer, bull elks torn in half, holes dug through the fresh body of animals from the inside out. While seeing things like this is unsettling, I usually shrug them off as some kind of nasty parasite or bear attack. The thing that made me wonder whether or not I was up against something much bigger didn't happen till recently while near the Wyoming-Colorado border in between outposts in the first week of December. To start, it was snowing fairly lightly, kinda spitting really. The pines stopped most of the snow falling on me while I was walking back to my ATV. While it was snowing lightly, the layer on the ground was at least a foot deep off trail making it pretty difficult to move or be quiet while lumbering through it. I got on the ATV and drove about a half mile up the trail, almost crossing over into Wyoming, when I noticed another trail that looked freshly made. When I got off the ATV I noticed some small droplets of blood in the snow going down the trail, with what looked like bear prints with something dragging behind it. I grabbed my gun off the rack on the ATV and slung it over my shoulder. The trail looked fresh, but the prints and blood were starting to get covered in a layer of snowfall. While walking along the trail, I noticed something kind of weird in the middle of the bear tracks. It looked like a human foot almost, but rather elongated and thin, with only four toes on the end. The tracks twisted within the bear prints themselves, almost like the animal's foot spun a bit coming out of the bear track. I continued on while occasionally glancing into the track, and sure enough the prints were still there. When I go to the end in a large clearing, I stopped following the bear tracks something about being in this large clearing with an unknown animal was making me uneasy. I mapped it out and placed a red line over it, indicating a high predatory area. On the way back, I noticed something strange about my own boot prints. Now, I'm a pretty big guy, standing at 6 feet 2 inches with a size 13 boot but whatever had made the tracks had a footprint significantly larger than my own. But that's not the worst part. Whatever it was, had followed my boot prints back, heading the same direction I was. Whatever it was, it had snuck behind me and was heading towards my ATV. I shoulder my rifle and put a round in the chamber. I walked back, glancing down every so often to see if the twisted footprints were indeed still in mine. When I got back to my ATV, I noticed that the prints circled my vehicle and stopped behind it and shuffled a bit. I then noticed that my jerrykin was missing, and that thing had left a trail of gasoline down the road from where I came. I hopped on my quad to get going in the opposite direction, hoping to distance myself from whatever stole my fuel. After crossing over into Wyoming, I noticed that everything was rather still. It was still snowing, but the flakes almost seemed to be suspended in the air. Not falling, but not static either. I couldn't hear anything when my ATV was shut off, no animals, no snowfall, not even my own breathing. Almost like something had stopped all sound from existing. I found another game trail, this time a few hundred yards off the trail. I dismounted and walked towards the opening in the trees, with pristine snow covering the rocky terrain around me. All along the trail, I would catch fleeting glimpses of a shadow. Not shadows, no. Just one. Moving along the trail with me. I put it off to lack of sleep making me see things. On my way back, I got a chill up my spine. In my own boot prints were the same tracks I saw at the last trail. The same twisty human-like print but this time, something was touching the ground in front of them. A swipe here and there, almost like whatever IT was, was tracking me by my scent. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I reached for my sidearm, kicking myself for leaving the rifle on the ATV. 
I heard a ragged breath from my left. Like if you collapsed a lung on a deer. I drew and fired into the trees, striking an aspen and blowing a hole in its small frame. I saw nothing. No movement, no snowfall, no animal. I started getting the same feeling I was getting from the clearing, and ran back to my quad. Whatever had been following me, beat me there. I followed the tracks around my ATV like last time, and stopped to see what it took next. It took my rifle. My rifle. A large rifle that would require something very large to carry it off in its mouth, or something with hands and the strength to carry it. I looked a little closer at the prints, and found something I had missed every time. Inside the footprints, right where the twist ended, I noticed four very long appendages peeking through the twisted snow. It looked like a monkey foot, but longer and more hand-like, but not quiet enough to be human. I mounted and hit the throttle, spinning out a bit until I got traction, and went shooting down the road. I was too low on fuel to go back to a main road where I could get help, and was forced to go to my next outpost. When I arrived, the small cabin hut-like structure looked so comforting and protective I almost cried. It had fuel for the quad, a safe place for me to sleep, and a radio for help. The sun was setting, and I was firing up the stove after starting the generator when my radio crackled and came to life. I jumped when I heard the static hiss. I ran over to the radio and requested an evac or an extra team for a safe escort. When asked why, I lied and said I was being hunted by a bear and lost my rifle on the trail. The voice on the other end scoffed btu obliged. My team would be there by morning. When I hung up the radio and started to get comfy and safe, I heard a loud thump hit my door. I froze in my bed, not knowing what to do. I finally got up after debating whether or not just hide. I'm no coward, I thought. I grabbed my side arm and walked towards the door. I peeked out the small window to see if someone or something was out there. All I saw was darkness. Stupidly, I opened the door and shouted if you don't leave, I'm going to kill you. You took one of my guns, but I still have the other. No response. I looked at my door to see what hit it, and only saw the remnants of a snowball. A fucking snowball. I waited to see if I could see any movement, when another snowball came flying out of the darkness to my left and hit my shoulder. You better run, or I'm going to fucking kill you. I yelled, as I slammed the door shut and ran out to confront whatever threw the snowball. I ran towards where the ball came from, watching for prints or signs of movement. I saw something in the darkness that looked like a man had fallen, and was scrambling on the ground to get up, making that raspy breathing noise. I stopped and aimed, but saw that whatever was in front of me had continued to run on all fours at an alarming speed. Faster than I could run. I froze when I saw the black silhouette dart off into the darkness, not sure what to do. After listening and hearing nothing, no breathing, no running, I headed back to my hut. Once I got to the clearing my hut was in, I stopped. Relieved I had made it out of the woods alive. I took a deep breath and calmed myself down, and started walking towards my cabin, illuminated by the lone porch light on the deck. I looked down, trying to follow my tracks back to conserve energy, and nearly vomited. The twisted footprints were in my tracks, heading towards the cabin. I saw the trail heading back towards my cabin, each twisted footprint slamming down into my own until it got to my porch. Amidst all the snow dragged on by the thing, was my rifle and jerry can, placed neatly on the porch, leaning against the wall. The door was a and Jared open a bit. I could have sworn I saw the leg of the thing dart in as soon as I looked at it. I wish I could say I bursted in there and shot the thing dead 
but I was too frozen with fear to do anything but stand there. I wish I could say I was brave and fought the good fight, but I didn't. I crumpled onto the ground, cradling my knees until sun up. I had spent six hours in the darkness, waiting for whatever that thing was to come out and finish me. But it never happened. My crew found my covered in snow with my gun drawn and pointed at my cabin. They questioned me and searched the cabin. All of my food was eaten, my bed was torn up and made into a makeshift nest thing like a dog would sleep in, and the radio was destroyed, but no sign of whatever was haunting me. Camping with friends Walking along this path with my friend talking loudly. She asks me. Oh crap, Meg did you bring that extra sleeping bag for me? Yeah I got it, we're good. We keep walking. Getting pretty far away from camp. Suddenly from the brush crossed the stream that our path paralleled. Be he did ye brbrbringda ee 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 tra ep beer gefo me. It was so inhuman sounding like an animal almost. It repeats several times. Each time it sounds more and more like my friend we are terrified. We start running back. Here leaves moving behind us, too afraid to look. From behind us in a low whimper. What I'm hurt. Sounds just like me. I'm crying. We keep running. As we get closer to the opening into the field we were camping in the bushes our thicker were not real fit and we had been running pretty hard. Gasping for air. Directly from the right of us. Tired yet. Sounds like her again with almost a bark. Shaking so hard at this point. I turn and look back. See this massive mound of fur in the bushes turn and go back the way we came from. Get to camp and tell our friends what happened. They of course don't believe us. We refuse to stay there that night. Get in her car and drive to town and sleep in a cheap motel. About 10 p.m. her phone rings. Friends at the camp. Jesus will you guys give it up? It's been two hours you're not scaring US just keeping US from sleeping. Friend gets hysterical telling them to leave. They're convinced we drove back there are in the woods yelling that we're hurt and for them to come help us. I turn up the motel TV and let them hear that we're in town. They hang up immediately and drive to our motel and spend the rest of the night. Next day we go back for our shit and never go camping again. Be me. Nashville 2017. If you know anything about the city, you'll know that it was around this time it started getting big, what's important to note is that before this, the city was a near perfect blend of rural and urban, not everywhere, but a lot of places, I lived in a suburb where driving 15 minutes in opposite directions would take you either downtown, or into natural reserve territory, it was in this suburb I had my first legitimate spiritual encounter, and I will die on the hill that I didn't imagine any of it, be brother, find free 90s style TV, beaten up but pleasant aesthetic, Mom doesn't want it in the house, hide it in the backyard until coming to decision on what to do with it. Backyard nothing but thick copses of trees and nature. Remember, depending on where you live there's a perfect blend of city and nature. It wasn't uncommon for some neighborhoods to be divided by thick patches of legitimate forest. Eventually come to the decision to hide it in forest. Secret forest I doubt dot secrecy. Wait until nightfall to move it cause HOA is trash. Nightfall. Join brother to hide it in forest. Halfway through backyard when. Something's wrong. Feel something's wrong. Brother, watch right talking about dot drugs. Seriously, be quiet. Everything is silent on a humid summer's night. No bugs, no wind, no people, no crickets. Something is seriously out of place. Distinctly feel like we're being watched, but there are no neighbors out at 11 p.m. Feel multiple pairs of eyes, start looking around. Nothing around. Broth. Brother starts talking again and tell him to be quiet. Do. You feel. No we're not. That, we're being watched. Keep looking around because something is watching us, multiple somethings feel chill. Feel chills up my spine and goosebumps. Phew. 
Seconds later, the most, the most stereotypical fog rolls in, wide, covers vision, but not thick enough to not see through. Something is seriously not right, start panicking cause I can't find the source. Quickly as it, as it came in, fog disappeared. Couldn't DNT have been more than a minute? When it disappears, revealed the location of the staring. I distinctly remember it and my description hasn't changed in the years since this took place. To one side of our house, next to a tree lining, was what I could only describe as, as an inky groupo of malevolent entities. I remember staring at that patch of darkness and seeing this group's eyes piercing through my brother and I. Their stares felt oily, inky, and dark. That is the most apt description I can give of how it felt being stared at by them. Almost as important was that I could tell they were malevolent, I could tell they meant to cause harm to my brother and I. What they were going to do, and when, I had no idea, but I know for a fact they meant us harm. Terry at the entities. Stare. Brother is mildly freaking out cause he can't sense them, and I'm acting borderline Shizo. Why haven't they hurt us? As soon as the thought enters my mind, another group above the tree lining reveals themselves. At least three times bigger than malevolent spirits. Saw. The group as they kept the entities at bay. Guarding my brother and I from their harm. Two groups standing there menacingly this is a spiritual cold war. Who's going to give first? After that incident, I remember looking at games like Final Fantasy, or any RPGs that have you fighting spirits, gods and laughing. Standing before the two groups, I remember as clear as day I had zero amounts of fear, for the simple reason I couldn't comprehend what was in front of me. I knew what I was looking at but I couldn't comprehend just how otherworldly these things were. I couldn't grasp their immensity like recognizing infinity, but only as a concept. You don't know how deep infinity really is. Malevolent group staring at us. Defending group staring at them. Continued for what felt like hours, was most likely 40-60 seconds. Malevolent groups vanishes like a wisp. Defending group watched them leave, stuck around for another 10 seconds to make sure they were gone. Leave. Crickets. Crickets come back. Tell brother we'll put the TV in the woods tomorrow. What no, let's do it now. I'm not. I'm not tempting that group to come back, we're going back inside. Left TV. In the open. Being raised Baptist, I think those were demons and angels respectively. My brother once asked me what I would have done had he ignored my warnings and kept walking, and I told him I'd have choked him out. It sounds edgy, but that's the only time I've ever said anything like that to him because it was a legitimate cold war between them, if we did something stupid, I'm not sure what would have happened aside from a dreadful certainty, that our lives would have been in legitimate danger. To this day, what astounds me most was the distinct lack of fear, I really couldn't grasp just how deep those entities were, maybe others have had similar feelings, maybe different, but that was mine. To provide some backstory, I'm 19. I live in New South Wales, Australia, up in the Blue Mountains. I moved into this house about a few months ago, my dad and I are DIY people, and the house needed a few improvements, but there were some awesome features about this house, one of which seemed awesome at first, but now I've come to hate is the fact that we live on the corner of our street and our house borders on hundreds of hectares of national park. I myself love the outdoors, hiking, rock climbing, you name it. I pretty much lived out in the bush since I was a kid. We have fixed up a whole bunch of the house and stuff is going well, but there is still plenty of work to go. The first paranormal experience I had up here was about three weeks ago, although this was the least eerie of the things I've experienced. It's about five o'clock, my dad, a close family friend and I were sitting down on the porch sharing a beer after a long day of working on the house. Let's call family friend Dave. Nine o'clock rolls around and Dave heads off for the night, me and my dad sit around until about eleven just chatting about life in general. Dad heads inside and I decide to stay outside and finish my beer. Now it's dead quiet around my house, so this caught me off guard. I hear rustling in the bushes, moving from left to right in my yard at a speed unmanageable by any creature that lives near me. This obviously scares me a bit, because holy fucking shit it was fast, my yard is about 40 m wide, and it covered it in about 5 seconds, it startled me. 
I assumed it was probably a low flying bat and that there was nothing to be worried about. At the far corner of my yard I heard a noise that I can only describe as pure terror. I can't see to the bottom of my yard as it's covered in bush, and just out of the porch lights reach, so I wasn't able to see it at that point in time. This noise could be described as a slow creaking noise, but it was being made by something that was alive, almost like it had an extremely dry throat and was trying to make scream. Everything about this noise was wrong. I was frozen in fear, I literally couldn't move. Eventually I decided on leaving my beer, standing up slowly and walking back inside. The noise stopped and when I went inside, or at least I was unable to hear it for a while. I walked into my room, turned on my fan, kicked off my shoes and climbed into bed. Now I don't usually sleep with my fan on because sometimes it fucks up and makes a loud ass noise, but it was hot. About 30 minutes later, my fan turned off and my phone stopped charging, I decided it was probably just some electrical fault due to the work on the house earlier that day, I called it a night and tried to get some rest. The day after I woke up, had my breakfast and tried to turn on the TV, but it refused to turn on, I get up fairly early, around 7, so the rest of my family was asleep. I went outside to check the circuit breaker, and it had been pried open by something large and the main power switch had been turned off. This fucking scared me, it was then I remembered the noises from the previous night and something felt so wrong about all this. I went back inside to talk to my dad about it. Dad woke up around 9, I told him immediately and he said that he would check it out, and that I needed to calm down, as the power might have tripped. I then went on to explain the way that the metal case surrounding it had been opened by crowbar or something. Dad went out to check and he was pretty concerned about it. This was pretty much the end of it, we never really did anything about it, which would prove to be really stupid later on. A few days go past and nothing out of the ordinary happens. It was late at night on a Friday and I generally have my mates over for a get together, so we were all sitting around on the porch chatting about guy shit when the fucking bushes rustled from right to left at the front of my yard, like it did a few days earlier. I started shitting it and explained what happened to my mates. Let's call my friends Matt, John, Paul, and Ray. Matt is a frequent ex-user and believes in spirits, ghosts, demons, the usual spooky stuff. Matt works as a plumber, and drove his ute here. Him and and Paul drive the ute down to the backyard so that they can use their high beams to see what it was. Me, John and Ray, sit around and try to see what it was, but pretty much just end up staying quiet. John speaks up probably a fox or some shit man. Me and Ray both spend a lot of time in the outdoors and explain there is no ways a fox moved through that thick bush so quickly. We stop our bickering as we can hear an engine start in the distance, Matt drives his ute around and turns on his high beams. That was the first time I saw it. The engine stopped and I looked over at the car. About five meters from the front of the car, was a white, pale, figure, no taller than five feet, that had arms so long they touched the ground. Everyone was shocked, silent as anything. I looked over at the others, trying to figure out what the fuck we were going to do. The figure looked like its jaw was unhinged from its face, literally every human quality it had was mangled in some way, its face didn't look like it had eyes, everything about it filled me with disgust. Suddenly the car engine starts again, the figure disappears within an instant, and the ute reverses as fast as it can. A-U-S-D-U-D-E here from Hervey Bay, also Murray Dude. Listen man we always hear stories from proper old aunties about tall lanky looking humanoids that used to come in and snatch yo kids up. If you really are worried about this talk to your local quarries. Find an elder, ask about local sorry sites women's business sites old legends similar to this. Use Gracio Casuarina Glaca smoke for bad spirit cleansing and also Pandana smoke for general good vibes cleansing. 
I'm not normally one for smoking oils crystals sort of stuff but I don't really questions the sort of advice from community and elders. Hey stalker, hope you enjoyed the video. If I could trouble you, give a like and a sub, it really helps the cause. And since you're already here, why not watch the next video? Anyways, stay comfy. Cortisol is bad for you.